Okay, welcome back, Anatomy. Today we are going to review Chapter 8. Um, I don't have a fancy PowerPoint for you today. I just have the same version of the review packet as you do. So I'm just going to go through my answers to the review packet since I'll be out of class. Um, so first of all, we're comparing general and special senses. Remember, general senses are found all throughout your body. So you have temperature, touch, proprioception. Those are found all throughout our body. So over here, this is going to be general senses. Special senses are localized to specific areas. So we talked about um, taste, vision, sound, balance, and smelling. So these are our special senses because they're found only in certain areas. Uh, the different brain areas that each of these senses are interpreted. So we learned this in a previous chapter when we did the brain, chapter 7. Um, but the vision is responsible for the occipital lobe is responsible for vision. Um, temporal lobe responsible for hearing. Cerebellum responsible for equilibrium. Smell is, is interpreted in the temporal lobe. And taste is in the parietal lobe. Then you were asked to identify the nerves. Each of those are um, using to travel information from their sense organ to that part of the brain. So the vision is using the optic nerve, hearing is using the cochlear nerve, equilibrium, the vestibular nerve, smell, olfactory nerve, and the taste is cranial, cranial nerve 9, the glossopharyngeal nerve. All right, um, the eye diagram here, I'm going to let that you just compare that to your own diagram. But on the test, we're going to do something a little bit different. You've already taken a quiz over labeling, so you've already identified that this is the iris. On this test, rather than identifying the structure's name, you need to identify the structure's function. So this is kind of a two-part thought process. You're going to look at this, and you're going to say, that's the iris. What does the iris do? The iris controls the diameter of the pupil. So that's what I'm going to be looking for. I'm going to be looking for the function of each of these structures rather than their names. Um, so here's the structures you would look for. This is a matching. So um, the cornea acts like a window, controls um, a little bit of the focus of the light. It's our first refractory um, component. The aqueous and vitreous humors both maintain internal pressure of the eye. The iris regulates the size of the pupil, as I said before. The lens is another refractory component. It's going to bend or flatten slightly in order to direct light to that fovea centralis, hopefully. The optic nerve transmit impulses to the occipital lobe in the brain. That's where images are fixed up. A lot of people got that wrong on the lab. Um, so the image is upside down when it hits your retina, and then your brain is, is what's going to tell you you are not standing on your head. You're actually on your feet, and that stop sign is upright. Um, we didn't really talk a whole lot about the lacrimal gland. Anything lacra is referring to tears. So we talked about the lacrimal bone on the inner portion of our eye or the inner corner. And um, inside there, connected to your nose, is your lacrimal gland. So when you cry, you get tears, but you know, you get a runny nose, and that's because those tears are coming out your nose. The sclera, that white portion that is very tough, we found when we try to cut it open, that protects and maintains the shape of the eye. The retina, we call it our sensory tunic because it contains the photoreceptors, the rods and cones. The cones are responsible for color vision. They're most active in bright light, and they help us see details. Rods are responsible for black and white. They're more active in the dim lights. They give us more peripheral vision and help us identify more specific details in contrast. The fovea centralis, that's our point of focus. Um, we only find cones here. It's our point of greatest visual acuity. Acuity, remember, is clarity, how clear the image is. The ciliary bodies, those are the muscles inside of the eye connected to the lens, and they are contracting to bend the lens or they're relaxing to let the lens flatten slightly. Um, the blind spot, that's where the optic nerve enters the eye, right, or exits the eye, however you want to look at that. Um, so it has another name, the optic disc, 
and we have no rods or cones there, so we have no vision. The suspensory ligaments, they connect ciliary bodies to the lens, so when the, the, lens, the ciliary body contracts, it pulls on the ligaments, which pulls on the um, lens and causes it to become more convex. Accessory glands, we didn't talk a whole lot about, but myobium glands, you read about, um, they produce an oily secretion. Um, ciliary gland secretes a lipid-like substance. Um, it adds a superficial layer. You might hear it called the, the tear film. So this kind of holds lipids and waters. They don't go together, right? So they repel each other. So by having the lipid layer, it keeps water in your eye so it doesn't come out. Um, identify the refractive components. So I'll probably ask you to go superficial to deep. From the outside, work your way in the pieces that bend light. So we have cornea, aqueous humor, lens, and vitreous humor. If I'm going too fast, you can replay this later and slow it down. Uh, the vision lab, what did you notice? So we covered kind of, we made a barrier between two eyes. We shown a light in one, which we would expect that pupil gets smaller, but we might have been surprised in that both pupils got smaller. So um, that's the pupillary light reflex, regulates the amount of light entering the eye. So if it's dim, it gets bigger, and if it's bright, it gets smaller. Um, remember, you have that optic chasm that kind of connects both eyes to the, both parts of the brain. So nerves from both sides of the brain are going to both um, eyes, so that would explain why when you innervate one eye, the other eye responds. Adaptation has to do with two things. You can adapt to the amount of light, and that would be the pupillary reflex, and you can adapt to the darkness. So in light, rhodopsin falls apart into its components, and then after a little bit of time, if you've walked into a dark room, you'll notice that you can start to kind of make out images, and what you're doing is waiting for rhodopsin to reform. That's visual purple. And so once it reforms, we're able to access our rods again, and we're able to see better in the dark light. The Snellen measurements, um, remember I want you not to, to tell me that this is nearsighted, but be able to interpret this. So this was the big E chart. When you looked at it, you identified you were 20, 40, 20, 60, whatever. The top number is how far away you are standing. The other number is how far away the normal eye is standing. So at 20 feet, you can see what the normal eye see is at 40 feet. So they can be a little bit further back than you. Retinal fatigue. So when we looked at something red, maybe we closed our eyes, saw the same image in green. Um, so this happens because disassociation of retinal um, photopigment. So if I was doing red, the red um, erythrolabe has fallen apart. And so... It's no longer sending signals, but the green chlorolabe is still sending signals. The positive after image occurs because that photopigment is still together, and so it's still sending signals. Um, the negative image is due to retinal fatigue. Peripheral vision, uh, you put a disc on your head and you moved different colors around, and you should have found that you had a better um, range with the black and whites than you did with the colors because we, our cones are centralized whereas our rods are more peripheral so that should have given us more of a peripheral vision you checked out your blind spot it might have been 14 inches 11 inches 13 inches but it was kind of cool to realize and that happens because we don't have any photopigments um, where the nerve exits the eye so accommodation was one people struggled with this if you're looking at something up close, your eyes get tired. So remember that. You usually don't strain your eyes when looking out into the distance for a while. You're straining when you're looking up close, which means those muscles are working a lot. Our muscles get tired when they're working. So up close, we're constantly trying to bend the lens to get light into a certain point, like a, a single point um, in the back of our eye. Because at when things are up close, when they go through the light starts to diverge and you want to bring it back together. So the ciliary bodies have to work hard to manipulate this lens. So it causes the lens to bulge more. It causes it to become more convex. And that would be accommodation. 
Some things that we were unsure of were the disorders, perhaps. Um, so a sty, you may have experienced a little bump in your eyelid. This is when the ciliary glands become infected with bacteria, oil, or some sort of debris causes a blockage of that gland, and so it can't drain, which creates swelling. Conjunctivitis, the conjunctiva is a membrane on the top of your eye, like outside of your cornea. It's continuous with the underlids above and below your eye, so that's all one membrane. That can become inflamed and creates reddening. So conjunctiva is that membrane. Itis, remember, is inflammation of. So it's an inflammation of the conjunctiva. It can simply be due to irritation. It can also be due to bacteria or viruses, in which case it's pink eye. You've, you may have been exposed to that at some point. Glaucoma is an increased pressure in the eye, so intraocular pressure. Um, it's due to the aqueous humor's failure to drain. So remember we talked about the canal of Schlem kind of in this region, and um, now I'm trying to picture a diagram. But anyways, the aqueous humor is not draining through the canal of Schlem. Cataracts, that's a cloudy or opaque appearance of the lens. So the sheep eye that we dissected, you all thought that they had cataracts, but that wasn't the case. Um, they're just no longer living <laughs> tissues. Um, so this can be related to diabetes. It can be related to overexposure to ultraviolet radiation. It's pretty common as people get older, um, and so they might have their lens removed and a new one put in. Okay, so here's our vision errors. You have nearsightedness, which is called myopia. This is because the eye is too long or the, the cornea is too curved or you might say the lens is too strong, so the bending is too much. So that causes light to come together short of the retina. Farsightedness, hyperopia, so it's going above, hyper. Light is focusing behind the retina. And this happens because the eye is short, or the cornea is too flat, or the lens is lazy. You can't pull it as well. And then if you have normal vision, yay you, you are the luckiest in the world. That's emetropia, so images are coming together at a point on your fovea centralis. You read about presbyopia. I don't have it in here, but presbyopia is when you get older, you're no longer able to adjust the lens, and so you lose that nearsightedness. Okay, um, difference between rods and cones. So rods are for black and white. Cones are for color. They are both uh, versions of bipolar neurons. They're both photoreceptors. Um, let's see, the tunics, the three layers of the eye. Again, I might ask you from superficial to deep. So sclera is the most superficial, choroid and retina. That was in your lab. Uh, the nicknames, the fibrous tunic is the sclera, the nutritive or vascular tunic because that's where the blood supply is, is the choroid sensory tunic because that's where we have our photoreceptors. So structurally, Neurons can be unibi or multipolar. These are all bipolar in our special senses that we've been talking about. Okay, we want to know external and internal muscles. So our rectus and oblique muscles that we talked about were all external. They move our eyes. So if I pull on my superior rectus, my eye goes down. If I pull on my inferior obliques, my eyes go down. What did I just say? Superior oh, rectus, eyes up. Inferior rectus, eyes down. Lateral rectus takes my eyes out to the side, whereas the medial rectus brings them to the middle. The superior oblique depresses the whole eye and causes it to look, causes you to look down and inward. Um, introversion. And then the inferior oblique causes you to roll your eyes outward. It elevates the whole eye and then rolls it out. So that's an extraversion. You have two internal muscles, the ciliary bodies that bend the lens and the iris that controls the pupil. So if we are to go from outside to in, I know this is a test question. You have the cornea, the aqueous humor, pupils, lens, vitreous humor, and the retina. So you should be able to follow lights, rays from the in to where it's headed. 
The optic chasm, if you look at this picture, this allows us stereoscopic vision. So the blue is our medial, and notice it's crisscrossing. The red is our lateral, and it goes straight back. So this allows a picture from the right eye and a picture from the left eye to be superimposed on one, each, one another. So that gives us a 3D view. Not only do we have this version over here, but on the other side of my brain, I have another set of two that are put on top of each other as well. All right, I'm gonna let you just look at the eye or the ear diagram. You can compare it to your own. Um, <clears throat> you will have an ear diagram on this test. And unlike the eye diagram where I'm having you do the functions, this one you just straight up are labeling um, the diagram. There's a word bank and it'll be a fill in the blank, so to speak. You'll just put the pinna here, auditory canal here, like that. I most likely will use uh, Malleus, Incus, and Stapes. I already have it photocopied. I think those are the words I used. Um, talking about the eustachian tube or the auditory tube here, it allows for you to equalize pressure between the external and internal environments. The cochlea, the snail looking thing here, transmits impulses related to hearing. The external auditory canal, which we knew as the meatus in chapter six with the bones. Um, that's just uh, channeling sound vibrations toward the middle ear. The incus transfers vibrations to the stapes. Malleus transfers vibrations to the incus. The pinna, what? What's that you say? The pinna is the fleshy part of the ear and it acts like a sound funnel um, or a sound shell diverting sound into the canal. The semicircular canals, the loop-de-loops, they're responsible for dynamic equilibrium. They look like the uh, roller coasters at Cedar Point, I think. Uh, the stapes transmits sound vibrations to the oval window while the, where they will be turned into liquid waves. The tympanic membrane, you know as the eardrum, and that transfers sound waves into vibrations, mechanical vibrations. In the, I, sorry, I jumped ahead, vestibule here. The vestibule transmits impulses related to static equilibrium. And then in the cochlea, you have the organ of Corti, which contains hair cells related to sound. They're going to be stimulated by movement of the paralymph. In the vestibule, you have hair cells that are responding to movement of otoliths that are moved because of endolymph. So they're responding to movements of our head. So our position in space. Semicircular canals, rotary motion, angular motion, hair cells are moving because the cupula has been moved by the endolymph. So this is static equilibrium. This is the otoliths up here. These are your hair cells here. As you move your body's position, See, he's bending over. The otoliths move, and then they bend the hair cells in a specific direction. Uh, similar, this is the organ of Corti. So the hair cells are in there. Here they are. And when the paralymph moves, it causes a bending of hair cells, which sends signals then to the brain. Similar concept um, with dynamic equilibrium, only you're using the cupula, so the cupular flap. Uh, moves the hair cells. Um, what factors can influence your senses of taste and smell? So we didn't do this lab, but you guys are pretty familiar with your taste and smell. So you might know that there's things that you find delicious because they look fabulous. Or if they don't smell good, you don't even want to eat them. Um, color, texture. I do not like avocados. People tell me it's because of their texture. I don't know. I think I don't like the way they taste. Um, experiences you may have had with food. If you had fish and you got sick, you probably don't like fish anymore. So all of those things can affect how something tastes or smells to you. All right, we learned um, our tongue map. Sweet is on the tip of our tongue. Salty is towards the front, sour on the side, and bitter in the back. Um, when it comes to adaptation, we're no longer responding to stimuli because they're not, it's not changing. So this allows us to conserve energy. 
So sound, or I'm sorry, smell and taste both use chemoreceptors. They're both responding to many of the same chemicals in solution. So they're responding to the same stimuli. They're also literally connected. There's a hole between our mouth and our nose. So any odors that are coming through our mouth can go into our, coming in our mouth go into our nose. So we're going to smell and taste it at the same time. And vice versa, any that are going into our nose can go right into our mouth and stimulate uh, cells in our mouth. So again, we smell and taste them at the same time. And then uh, this is not the same diagram you had, but I'm sure I had you identify the olfactory bulb. I don't remember all the things that I had you um, identify. These are your olfactory receptors. Um, the cribriform plate, that's the bone that it's found in. You might have had to identify that. The, the frontal lobe, maybe. Um, the nasal cavity. I don't think you had anything in the mouth there, but you have um, taste receptors on your tongue, your cheek, your soft palate, all of those. So that's it for your review packet. Um, I'll be back tomorrow so we can have fun taking a test together, and that's our last chapter test for the semester, and it's time for final exams. So I'm sure you'll do great.